Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope everyone had a great weekend. Um, and it goes so fast, but thank you for being here this morning. Before I start the, the meeting, I would like to introduce my new executive assistant slash special projects oh. coordinator, <laughs> Dion Tien. Yeah. She's, 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 she's my <laughs> Thank you, Dion, for joining. Thank you. Yeah. Public comment, we have two, three, four people, four people who signed up this morning. The Board of Commissioners mm -hmm. welcome our citizens' comment. It is my goal to make these meetings run smooth and efficiently and effectively in order for the government to run. In this vein, I ask everyone to follow the rules of the body as directed by the chair. Also, I ask that everyone please assist me in keeping order in this room during the deliberative process so that our citizens' time, including those watching on TV and our time, is not fruitless. When I give a warning about timeliness or request order, I ask that you observe it. If I give a second warning about timeliness or request for order, the same is not observed, observed I will ask um, our sheriff, which is our law enforcement present, to restore order in this meeting. Also, please be mindful of the three minute limit and when you hear the buzzer, please wrap up your sentence. When you come forth, please state your name and address for the record. First on the list today is Ms. Ellen Wynn, McGuire. Did I say that right? McGrayer. Yes. Um, my name is Ellen Wynn McGrayer. Um, I'm with Jones Wynn Funeral Home in Crematory here in Douglas County. I come to you today as a friend in the community first and a business owner. Second, after reading about the overspending in the coroner's office, um, this isn't really something that I want to come into, but I just feel like I need to share our story something that some of you may not know. So I, I feel like it was a heated argument after I read this uh, article, but with the overspending, it's just when those, those issues that are so heavy hearted to you that, <clears throat> that you um, don't feel like you have a choice, that's where we are today. And even after reading this, I'll tell you this story first about a, a preacher that was sitting with a family. This happened um, after this article was written and the family was talking about their loved one that passed away and it was in the middle of the night. The preacher praised the Lord that this family had somebody that would, could be an advocate for them, ended up stepping out and calling our funeral home and asked us, can your funeral home handle this and this cremation for this family? Because the coroner representative, Mike Axley, is telling them a much different story. He said that you can't handle it. Um, families in this community, we could handle it, and we still can. We were the only funeral home in this county that had a morgue when no other funeral home did, and the county didn't. We offered it to the county at free of charge. We didn't ask for business in return. We're the only funeral home in this county that has their own crematory. The reason that I didn't come before is if it wasn't your choice to use uh, an establishment that ha had a cremation service and crematory in the county, then that was up to you guys. We've been the lowest bid in 2017. In this new administration, we've never been approached for a bid. We were the lowest because we can do it in-house instead of outsourcing it. That's a decision that the county would make if they want to go somewhere else for a cremation. But when this year the coroner's office is a bigger competition to us than other funeral homes, I just wanted to ask when the county uh, turned the coroner's office into a business that is hurting us. And more importantly, the reason that I can't sleep at night is because families that have a broken heart already shouldn't have to wrestle the coroner's office to choose a funeral home. I can't tell you how many times if I had listed it on paper the numbers would be outrageous at families that walked us up to us at different community events to say I wish I could have used you guys but I was told different by the coroner's office. I, we were one of the first funeral homes and first sponsors for September Saturdays and this year when we sat out there with so many in the community I wish we could have used you guys. I didn't know we couldn't now. We have to explain, I'm not sure where you're getting these messages, but I think um, over time and after reading so much, it's, it's obvious where they're getting this misinformation from. Um, we um, are members of this community. We love this community. We're business owners in this community. And more importantly, I come to Hugh as a family that has lost my dad <coughs> tragically. And if I had had to fight a coroner's office to use the funeral home that I trusted, well, that's just not ethical. It's just not right. Um, but part of the business and the financial, my husband is more good with figures. Scott, we're third generation funeral directors. 
this administration is like night and day compared to what it used to be. And it's like day and night compared to Carroll County where we have a funeral home also. So with a heavy heart, I come to you guys, and if there's anything that you can do to help the citizens of this county who already have a broken heart, please do that. Because not only would it help financially in your budget, <coughs> but it was it's the right thing to do for families who lost somebody. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, <coughs> Ms. Ellen Wynn. Um, Ms. Wynn McGuire, just want to make sure I pronounce it right. Thank you so much for coming in. I, I, I have one more thing to add. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I do have the preacher is going to write a letter on that family's behalf. Okay. All the other families, as the gentleman that stood in our funeral home and he cried with tears because his wife was taken by Mac Axley to another funeral home. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go back to that gentleman and all the other families that have had to fight to use our funeral home. I'm not going to ask them and break their heart again because of a coroner situation. But the preacher is going to write it. He had a back issue, or I would have brought it today and handed it to you guys. Because I understand you need facts and proof, and we're going to provide what we can without having to break family parts all over again. Okay, thank you so much. I've actually asked my uh, purchasing director, we're working on bids, didn't realize, I, I didn't know what your price was, but it was under the impression all of it was $9.95 across the board. So uh, Bill Peacock, right here, Director Peacock, is working on that and okay. reaching out to all the, so I just asked, and I uh, thank you for saying the administration is day and night, but I had already jumped on top of it because I wanted to see if you had something. How did your price compare to all of the other prices? It, it, it's, our bids always come in less because we can do it in-house okay. and in Douglas County. Uh, and other funeral homes have to outsource it. Okay. Uh, Director Peacock, this win knows you, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the uh, draft is in the coroner's office right now for the okay. bid to be sent out, <coughs> so it should be out by before the end of the week. Coroner, I look forward to, yes. to being able to be a part of that again, like right. we were in 2017. Okay. And you will be. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, next we'll move on. We have Don Ray Leonard. Um, Don, please give us your, your address. I have a lot to spit out here, so I'm going to go kind of fast. Okay. And remember, I just want everybody to just be aware of the three minute limit, please. Okay, Don Ray Leonard, Criticide Manor, Subdivision in District 2. Title 45 16 7 of Georgia law clearly states a deputy coroner shall act as coroner only when the coroner is himself unable to act. The deputy coroners in Douglas County have been billing the county for death investigations that should have been performed by the elected coroner. The deputy coroners have invoiced for more deaths than are reflected in the records in the probate office as coroner-related case, death cases. So if that is Georgia law, then according to the amount of invoices from deputy coroners in 2017, coroner Godwin was in, unable to act as coroner every day last year. Since taking office, Coroner Godwin placed herself on call for only two days in 2017 and four <coughs> weeks thus far in 2018. During these weeks in 2018 in which she was supposedly on call, the county has been billed by her deputies for these investigations. Was she unable to act for the week? She placed herself on call in October of this year since Deputy Mike Axley billed for investigated deaths almost every day that week. Coroner Godwin should stay within her budget if she simply performed the duties for which she was elected and stopped burning gas and sporting a county car as her personal vehicle at taxpayer expense. Coroner Godwin recently requested an additional $21,000 to her already inflated 2018 budget to cover the cost of indigent <coughs> cremations. However, based on her 2017 <coughs> total for cremations and her 2018 total to date, she should have only required maybe an additional $6,000. I submit to you her request for the additional funds was to cover the cost of her deputy coroners doing the job she was elected to do. In 2017, Coroner Godwin overspent her budget by $92,000. Based on this figure, the Board of Commissioners set her budget for 2018 at about $191,000. Records show the total payments to the deputy coroners by the county in 2017 was for 292 investigations. Although Coroner Godwin stood before the Board of Commissioners in December of 2017, only two weeks before year end, and stated her department had investigated 261 cases. In that same meeting, Coroner Godwin stated the previous coroner only worked 124 deaths for all of 2016. <coughs> However, in a letter to the Board of Commissioners in February of 2017, she stated she found documentation that showed the previous coroner had worked 
249 deaths in 2016, a difference of 125 cases. She continuously misrepresents the numbers to the Board of Commissioners when asking for additional funding. Warner Godwin is an elected official, and it's time she was held accountable. Madam Chair, you have a duty to the taxpayers to act and stop covering for her blatant malfeasance. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Don uh, Since you mentioned my name, I, could, I, I would like to just kind of ch chat with you just for a second. Regarding number one, her budget was not over this year. It has not been over. Number two, she did not request $21,000. The Finance Committee is the one that we see that the, the in the direction that the deaths are going, we projected that it would possibly be 21,000. So that was based on projections from the Finance Committee. So she did not personally come and request anything. And I have done my due diligence uh, re regarding the coroner's budget and compared to 2016 versus now. And there is some discrepancy in before this administration, huge discrepancies. and. I can't share those with you right now, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to go back and forth. What I want to do, and I've mentioned on numerous occasions, I will take care of these citizens from Douglas County, in Douglas County, from sunrise to sunset, and I mean that. And also, I'll meet with you, and as, as we bid things out, Miss Wynn, I was already on top of it. I wanted to bid it out and make sure we get a lower price. The 985 is my understanding. We've been at 985 around here for 10 years. And I hope you can do better than 985 because that will help us really with our budget situation. But right now, uh, the coroner is not over budget uh, as far as I can tell. Maybe I need to check with my finance. But of course, <coughs> moving with those proper funerals, that's something that's a whole different discussion and I'd be willing to chat with you, Ms. Ray. So we're going to move on. Mr. Larry Pierce, please come forward and just give me your information as well. I'm about afraid to get up there. Oh, now, come on. <laughs> come on. I'll tell you what. I'm glad I got a red hat on. And Commissioner, I would also like to know what the charges for transportation. Okay, I will. That's, that's, a, that's a big, big, big issue that, that you would be interested in. Okay. You know, this is one of the few times that I'm last. I'm not very religious, but praise the Lord. You're not last, uh, Mr. Pierce. Larry Pierce, mm -hmm. 4120 Van Sant Road. Douglasville, Georgia. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is about the most I've ever heard of uh, taking it from the cremation to the dead subject. So, I invited a couple of friends of mine from Ohio, and uh, believe it or not, the first gal used to be in the 82nd paratroopers in the army and her sister from Ohio. I said, come down here and see some people at work. Man. Woo. Okay. What I'm here to talk about today is, uh, is the cooler. The one thing, as I told all y'all before, Nobody knows the job of someone because you're not in their shoes. But the other people get seen and what's going on. But in the case of someone who's segregated over in the far corner, you don't see what's coming or going. You don't know when she's there and she's not there. But since the cooler started being used in February, well, it's about February, I had a question to the <coughs> GBI, and I call them up and I said, when y'all get the body down there and you get through with your autopsy, what do you do? <coughs> said, well, we usually call the family or funeral. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Guess who's been going over there picking up bodies? Mike Ashley. 41 times. <coughs> and charging the county $175 each time and on one of them, there was a log. And I'm not talking about a log out in the tree. I'm talking about a log. A log is police work, and law means something that is chain of command. It's chain of who owns something, who controls it. They take it. The log, there was a log. There was a real piece of paper attached to the cooler. And I asked for it. Didn't know it existed, and I got it. 
told who took the body, who got it out, what time and all. Bah, 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 bah. Guess what happened the following month? It ain't there. Has it been any more long since then? Nope. Nope. Now, in the overall scope of a budget, this isn't just a great sum of money. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the ethics and people that we can trust to do things. Yeah. Fairness to the community homes of the funeral homes, okay? They are the only one that's full service. Partiality? Well, just depends sometimes who you are. Depends on who you've been hobnobbing with, okay? But the fact of the matter is, it needs to be looked into, it needs to be checked. Fairness, ethics, and what you got to do, okay? And that's what's going to happen. Because the only thing I know is when you get to be a senior, I found out what age has its preference. You come to vote, they said, hey, you can't go up there. You're not disabled. Uh, you're not in a wheelchair. I said, well, I, I don't know. I got up there. So let me tell you, the only thing in life that is an advantage of being 75 is you go to the head of the line when you vote. And that's it. Thank you so much, Mr. Peter. And my birthday is the 14th, and y'all can sing to me. All right, Mr. Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank right. you so much for your input. Right. Thank you for your service and being an 82nd paratrooper. My dad was a paratrooper in the Korean War. So oh. thank you so much. Yeah, that's it. Two tours out there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we will move on to Mr. Ben Davis. Mr. Ben Davis, please come forward and give us your address. And, um, your subject matter is the coroner as well. And please be mindful of the three minutes, y'all. I've been <coughs> pretty lenient this morning. Yes, ma'am, you are. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Ben Davis. Good morning. Uh, 3856 Hunt Road is where I live. Uh, I had something else to say, but I'm going to have to change it after I heard all these people over here. Uh, I have lived in the community for 12, 14 years. Uh, prior to the coroner being elected, I haven't heard nothing from none of y'all. I ain't see you come up here and Say, well, well, you know, I'm the funeral home, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm that, and we need to bid, and we need to do this. It sounds to me as though you're advocating for yourself. You're advocating for business. Now, one of the aspects in that is that uh, the county runs the county. This commission is what? Five people, Madam Chair? Yes. And including you, the chair. Now, I would assume because uh, I went a little bit further than high school and I ran a little bit uh, more things than businesses that anytime there is five people the chair is the tie-breaking vote or whatever and I would just call it you know in that particular manner the chair would delegate who would do what how would do what so forth prior to this and this is a question that I know you don't have to answer right now uh, the rest of the commissioners, have you all ever received a complaint about the coroner? Because I haven't heard anything about any district running about uh, uh, complaining about the coroner. Now, Kelly Robinson is my representative in District 2. I was just voted at Democratic Party. See, just that man, I never heard nobody say that. The only one I ever heard say was Ms. Gonk. Now, she evidently has the only dead people that want to complain about the coroner's office. Because every other commissioner uh, haven't said anything. Um, I appreciate some of the things that were said because a lot of things were speculation. Like, I don't work in the coroner's office, so therefore I can't get this. But one of the things a lady was up here saying, an obvious conclusion, there is no such thing as an obvious conclusion. You get information and you get facts. And then, and only then, do you come to a conclusion. Uh, the other thing is, like I said, uh, bid's not known. The chair told you, uh, you know, the corner didn't do this, or she did this, or she didn't do this, or she didn't. Now, what y'all think? She don't know her job? I believe she knows her job. I voted for her. Other aspect. 
261 cases, and then uh, the lady said it was, uh, I, I didn't get the other number because my little stuff fell down, so I got neuropathy. Unlike Mr. Uh, <coughs> Fortune Caller, I do have one of those cards because I, I, I lose my balance. And I'm not uh, 75, I'm 70. So therefore, I can get those perks for being over. <laughs> uh, the information, like I say, is wrong about the transportation. In, in my uh, thing over there, uh, another thing that I'm curious about is if all of us are on the same committee, and I have a question about a committee member and what they do or how they do it, <coughs> why is it not that we meet once a month at least? But I can't pick up the phone and call and say, look here. Uh, Mr. Davis. Yeah. That's it. Okay. All right. I'm going to be respectful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. I'll finish from Robson. You have a comment. Yeah. We're going to move on. Yeah, we'll move on. I, I'll, I'll be brief. I appreciate that everybody spoke pretty much had a representation of District 2, um, including the, um, the funeral parlor, which yeah. I advocated for um, getting <coughs> that territory um, some years ago. And so, I, I, you know, we, we can do better with the dialogue. I, I, we're going into, we're on the, um, we're in the eve of an, of an election. And I, I think that the sharpness of the dialogue and, and just the, it, we gotta move on. Yes, it's not the past, but we, we can be inclusive of how we move forward. Some of it is just so, so those who are looking at this are not caught up into the, the commentary, the puppetry of dialogue. It's like, guys, all right, some of it is excessive. And I, I simply believe we can do better. Madam Chair made a commitment that she'll look at this. It's her call. Let the people get the way in. We as district commissioners, likewise. But some of it is like, come on, guys. We're going on and on and on. And I, I just think we can do better. I really do. It, it, it won't go backwards, right? But it can go forward. And there's a way in which you approach. And sometimes it's just about approach that you can be heard and you, you can be considered. But it, it's one of those where, yes, we all change. We're all evolving, right? And so I just ask, now. I'll, I'll wrap this up. That let's, again, let's try to find a, a, a place of in the middle where we can move things forward. Um, duly noted, I get District 2. It, 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 it's vocal. I, I get it. I get my citizens. I get it. But there's a way to do this to move ourselves forward and, and not to be such a place that we, we, we break the fabric and the very thing that we're trying to move forward to is a better place. I yield, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to move on to presentations and uh, tomorrow we prepare to hear from our Director Holman regarding a distinguished budget pres uh, presentation from the uh, Government Finances uh, Officers Association. And is that the CAFR? CAFR. This is actually a different award. This is regarding the budget book, the 400 page document that I'm sure everybody reads. Okay. So uh, you'll be prepared tomorrow to right? present. Thank you so much, Director Holman. Next, we have uh, Douglasville, Douglas County Homeless Coordinated Entry, and Director Stanley has it. Two minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, my, my voice is a little shaky this morning. Good morning, <coughs> Good morning. Um, Tiffany Stewart Stanley, Director of External Affairs. Um, today, we are giving just a brief presentation on the Douglasville Douglas County Coordinated Homeless Entry um, Project. Uh, we've been working on this since about November of last year, working with the city law enforcement and with um, the school system along with organizations like the United Way to try to come up with a coordinated entry program to help the people in our county who need housing who are homeless. So today I have with me, um, we've been working with the Department of Community Affairs and I have Ms. Rebecca Hickam and Mr. Michael Thomas, Mr. Parnell Fleming is here from the city and um, this effort is also being led in the city by the assistant um, city manager. Chelsea Jackson. So I'll bring up Ms. Hickam and Mr. Thomas and let them proceed with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Could uh, you state your name for the record? My name is Michael Thomas. I'm with the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. Uh, I am the Continuum of Care Program Manager there. Um, and so before we do our update, I'm just going to provide a little bit of brief context for people uh, in the room who might not have as much detail as others. Um, 
So a continuum of care, uh, the easiest way to think about that is it is a HUD defined, uh, that's the US Department of Housing and Urban Development defined uh, planning jurisdiction for homeless services. Uh, the balance of state continuum of care we administer at the Department of Community Affairs. Uh, it covers 152 counties out of 159 uh, in Georgia. And then coordinated entry is a uh, mandated process. Each continuum of care uh, has to uh, devise a way for homeless people to access the system uh, in a coordinated way. Um, and that's what we've been working on. At DCA, in the balance of state continuum, excuse me, continuum of care, we have been doing this in a regional way. And one of the uh, local areas we've been working with is uh, here in Douglas County. Uh, and so we've got representatives from the county and the city, and we are uh, happy to have everyone working on that with us. So I'll turn it over to Rebecca for the update. Hi, Rebecca Hickam, and I'm the Coordinated Entry System Coordinator for the Valley <coughs> State Continuum of Care. I'll be very quick. But I do want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, and what the planning efforts look like here in Douglas County. So um, Coordinated Entry is really a streamlined way for individuals who are experiencing homelessness to access services. Um, the important part about Coordinated Entry is that there is a coordinated referral and assessment we're assessing individuals and families experiencing homelessness in the same way. Um, households um, are then prioritized for housing based on vulnerability. So we're looking at how long has someone been homeless? Um, are they frequent users of your jail systems? Are they frequent users of your hospitals? Um, vulnerability to death, vulnerability to staying homeless. That's the type of things we're looking at. Um, so obviously this is a, a mandate for HUD, so there are um, multiple organizations in your communities who receive continuum of care funding as well as other HUD homeless funding are required to do this, but when it works well, um, and I think it will work well in Douglas County, is when we have all of the partners, not just the ones who are required to participate, um, working to plan and coordinate these efforts, and we certainly have those, like Chelsea said, the county has been uh, a part of that, the city, um, Mr. Charles Branson is here from the Homeless Coalition, um, so we're very thankful for that. Um, so to tell you a little bit about just the planning efforts is that we are meeting on the second Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. at the Ike Owens Community Center. Um, some of the partners who are there are Share House, um, United Way, uh, Absolutely, so we've got lots of partners who are coming. Um, we're looking at planning efforts around landlord engagement. So we've got these folks who are coming and looking for houses. Where can we put them? Um, a lot of outreach and community engagement. So we've got some subcommittees who are focused on those things. Training, um, local policy for how this is going to look like here in Douglas. Um, there will be multiple sites around the county where people can go and be assessed and get access to the system. Um, the <coughs> county, this community is going to receive some funds from uh, the Emergency Solutions Grants Program to do this, about $70,000. Um, we're very thankful that the county and the United Way is taking the efforts in January to lead our point in time count, which is where um, it, communities across the nation uh, take one day a year and count the people who are experiencing homelessness or community. So go out in the middle of the night, um, talk with people, do outreach. So the county is leading those efforts, so we're thankful for that. Um, I think that's it. Does anyone okay. have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Robinson. Uh, Charles Branson is here? Yes. Can he take the podium? Sure. Charles, come on up. Yes, sir. Charles, good to see you. you you've been a long term. When I first came on board, we, we met. Uh, can you give a little bit of history of how you fit into this and, and what you mean for us here locally? Well, when we um, <clears throat> first really impacted uh, homelessness back in 2010 to 2011, it was through the uh, uh, Douglas County Continuum of Care Coalition, not to be confused with their Continuum of Care, it's just what we happen to name it, uh, which we've now been in the process of changing. The Douglas County Homeless Coalition. And it was originally founded, I believe, by West Tower. And uh, uh, our um, goal was to bring all the 
agencies that we could and all the individuals that we could that were concerned about homelessness together on one forum every other month uh, and so that we could uh, uh, avoid duplication of services uh, fill in gaps and needs that were out there and as a joint uh, group uh, work with uh, uh, monetary resources and grant sources to uh, to get uh, more funds and things for the county. So the, the Homeless Coalition is is there to make sure that the coordinated entry is a successful effort. And uh, the uh, the use coordinated entry, I've worked in Atlanta with nonprofits and so forth, is a very important part of being able to uh, know exactly what's going on with individual efforts in the community. No, I, I thank you for that. I just wanted to make sure that, because we had been working on this for quite some time, and I'm glad to see that we're strengthening uh, our commitment to um, the homelessness. And so here's my question, which gets more into um, your, your, your assessing. Sounds like data. You're collecting data as part of these requirements. And I, I'm, it, it, it's two things. Uh, in the collection of that data as a federal requirement, um, are the services actually getting to the people? Are they, um, how do we ensure that they're actually getting to the people versus some type of overhead administrative component? That, that's not for you, Charles, that's for them. I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And, and the second thing is I'm gonna focus more on mental health, all right? So we've got homelessness, all right? Uh, we have mental health, and how do they get the services that they need, um, uh, specifically uh, dealing with the mental illness component of that? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just stop there. Can you just answer that first? Sure, yeah, so I will say um, Douglas Cobb CSB, Community Service Board, um, are a part of those efforts. Um, we're looking at, we don't, we know that homelessness is not uh, an isolated issue. Generally, there are other issues. Um, so we're assessing all of those needs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea is that you want to surround a, an individual or household with services, and that's based on need. So part of the reason why we have all these partners at the table is to make sure that we're looking at those needs holistically. Um, so we're looking at churches, we're looking at um, food banks, certainly the school system. Um, so we, we want to make sure that that happens. Okay, okay. And I, I'll close with this, Madam Chair. I know we got a long agenda. So my, my question was more about um, our earlier efforts. Um, Commissioner Mitchell? Yeah, okay. Uh, we, uh, and this is to Charles, there was a challenge early on in 2010, I think this one, when this, this group of, of legislators, local legislators came on board, we had a, a challenge between the county and the city, it was a $10,000 grant, pure mm -hmm. cash, and then there was a match. Did you ever get those funds, and can you tell me, if, did you get funds, and did you, um, what value did it bring? With it all? Oh, we worked miracles with those funds. Uh, we, um, we got, um, a total of about $17,000 from the city, the sheriff's department, the police department, and the um, faith based coalition. And we got $10,000 from the county. United Way leveraged a $50,000 grant to bring up the PATH team in the Douglas County. Okay. And to, to explain that to you, those who don't know, PATH is a nonprofit effort funded by the Department for Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability mm -hmm. to identify people in the community who are homeless, that have mental health problems, who don't have housing and haven't been connected to mental health services. And um, the PATH team, since they came on board, they started with that grant and then it was taken over by Hope of Atlanta, which is currently running it for us and they've done an incredible job in the county in the past. Um, we, um, the United Way also leveraged other funds and, and kind of, they promised to, to do a one-to-one -one match with everything we raised. So uh, that was a big deal. And with a total of about $117,000, there, there were 34 people in the uh, Kroger Woods at that point in time. Right. One individual lived there for 18 years. One individual lived there for 14 years. And uh, we housed, permanently housed, 32 of the 34 within six months. Uh, the, the two that actually refused help, one has since um, qualified for Social Security disability and, and is, is living in, in conditions fit for human habitation now, is in a home and so forth. The other one left the county. So we had essentially everybody was taken care of in there. Most of them were housed in Clayton County 
because it's where most of the affordable housing is for somebody that you're trying to leverage help for and so forth. But it was, um, uh, it got a lot of attention in the Atlanta region and it got some t attention outside of the Atlanta region because what we did to, to house 34 people for uh, $3,000 and change permanently, and not that United Way probably didn't, didn't use more funds as necessary as they went down the line, is absolutely incredible. You know, if every community could do that, uh, homelessness wouldn't be a big issue anywhere in the country, I, mean, I can tell you. Uh, so we were very proud of it. Uh, unfortunately, funding sources in the county kind of lost interest after that, looking at the, the biggest part of the problem uh, being taken care of. But homelessness is uh, not a pond that you can dip dry. It's a river, and you have to keep working with it. And um, so, so that's a big issue. I'd also like, if I may, mention about mental health and uh, thank the Transportation Center. One of the big issues is getting people to Douglas County Outpatient Services over on Stewart Parkway. I mean, we have people that get out of the jail that might have been on a cocktail of medications to keep them stable uh, for four or five years, and they're released with a 30-day supply, no connections, no resources, and, and many are immediately homeless when they get out of the jail, and you have to just say, well, what happens when all that medication wears off? You know, and now through this fixed bus route system that we're going to have, they will be able to get over to the mental health services. Not everybody's going to access that, but I can tell you a huge number of the people out there want help and they want to get the services they need to have a better life. And I also mentioned that, that in my experience, well over half of, homeless, of the homeless population do have mental illness issues. Yeah, we do. I, I want to thank you for that, and I believe yeah. Madam Chair, I yield the floor back. Okay, thank you so much. Commissioner Biden. Yes, uh, Charlie. Um, are y'all connected with Dr. Ford's shelter? Yeah. Uh, and then Jerry O'Neill had a women's shelter. Um, I know I got uh, well, there's the, uh, some money for him uh, a couple of years ago, but I don't know what's happened. If there's Douglas County Homeless Shelter for women. That's Pardon? A, there's a Douglas County Homeless Shelter, which is a women's shelter. Right. That is and run by a church, I think. Well, it's under a Dr. Ford's wing right now, as I understand. Yes, it's the since Jerry passed away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, I don't know if the county's still funding that. I know I, I instigated the, the initial one, but I don't know if it's passed on from you. It yeah, it, it so if someone is getting that money. The mm -hmm. Douglas County Shelter. Okay. Is what is mm -hmm. the okay. I, just, I, just, <coughs> I don't remember anybody saying anything about it. But um, you mentioned a 10000 grant. $10,000 grant from the county. Yes, uh, is that a continuing thing? No, we wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it just seems like the county should uh, support uh, organizations that's really doing our work for us <laughs> because you're already established and, and it's, uh, it's working. So why not help fund those uh, things? Well, uh, I will add that I also work closely with the with, uh, uh, homes camp that we have that, that's been very successful. Um, and, um, and I know the county's helping with the Sanctuary Village mm -hmm. project and so yeah. forth. And, and that's going to help us a great, great amount. But, but I think your point is very well taken. Well, and, and one time, at one time when we were working together on the Character Coalition and everything, you would take leftover food, like at banquets and our restaurants and stuff like that, to the homeless yes, places. Are you still doing that? Well, unfortunately, most of these <laughs> events are catered, and the caterers uh, perceive liability mm -hmm. in releasing food after the banquet's over, which is unfortunate. Uh, so they can't, they don't, um, I, you know, they don't allow us to do that. Most, most don't. But I, I work with uh, churches in the area and. Organizations like Renaissance Douglasville, or I'm, I'm uh, familiar with that, that do uh, bring uh, homeless friendly food mm -hmm. to individuals, but not, not leftovers. So, how many beds does Dr. Ford have for men? I understand. 
Do you know? I do not know. I under, understood the last time I was in the facility that it was 14 beds at the Men's Assessment Center, which is the, the emergency shelter. Now, he has um, and then the various women's. transitional houses and, and apartments that he works with. I'm sorry. Then in the women's shelter, I think it's 45 beds, isn't it? So, I think so. Unfortunately, it. both facilities are usually full. When when we've gone out on outreaches over the over the years and found people that were ready for immediate shelter opportunities, uh, it's very difficult to have have a bed. Well, equipment. with women, oftentimes there's children involved too, and so uh, it's not just one bed per family. It may be two or three. Or hopefully an apartment that they that yeah. can be in. But I just wonder if you were working with these organizations that's already established. Absolutely. Yeah. And Vision 21, which is Dr. Ford's organization, uh, they have a seat on the Douglas County Homeless Coalition Board as well. Uh, we also um, uh, work with uh, kids' homelessness, uh, which is a huge issue. Uh, the school system has a different definition, but we, um, we work with the Kids' Home Initiative, which uh, we've had as many as 600 children identified as homeless, meaning they're living somewhere other than with their parents, and they're having to move uh, more than once during the school year. And, uh, and I believe the Kids Home Mission, which is mostly through Sweetwater Mission, has uh, uh, stabilized about 27 families a year, which is up to 100 of those children, which has really been fantastic. And I know that the school <coughs> system counts homeless people as people that move from one place to the other, um, why do they do that? Uh, well, just because you child, move doesn't mean you're homeless. If a child has to move to, um, to three, three different school, two or three different school systems during the school year, uh, that pretty well uh, <coughs> makes the school year um, uh, pretty well shot. It's, it really uh, interferes but, with the But why are they level. considered homeless? Because under the school system def definition, okay, <laughs> under the school system, system definition, if they're living with somebody other than their parents, so if they have to live with Uncle Joe and Aunt Mary, or if they have to live with Grandma and so forth, they're considered homeless. Wow. Okay. And you'll right, back. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. And I will say one last thing very quickly, if that's okay. Um, and that is about the, the data portion. Um, so administration, the funds are for the administration of the system. And we do, that is in addition to the funds that the federal government through the programs that we have at DCA are already putting. This is not in any way, shape or form taking away from those funds. These are in addition. And collecting data is really important for funders. Uh, so we, we can right size the amount of assistance for the community. So if we have an actual, um, idea in, in, in addition to the point in time count of how many people are experiencing homeless and their needs, we can do a better job of making sure that the funding is right size for this community. So that data collection is an important part of the system. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bulk, I think that's on the hand. Yeah, just, uh, just a, a, a brief uh, post-it note. Uh, the uh, it brought up about food donations in uh, the uh, federal government passed the food uh, good samaritan food donation uh, law uh, which basically negates the liability uh, from food donations the problem is past history <coughs> yes there was a liability and people don't know that this law is passed and at the same time restaurants uh, choose to use that as an excuse not participate and donate food. So if, if you would just look up the uh, Google search, uh, Good Samaritan Law, food donations, uh, you'll find the federal uh, reference to that. I yield okay. back. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Mitchell? Yes. Uh, Charlie, just, just a, one quick question. You talk about the 34, 32 people that, that were around the Kroger area and a couple of spots that you guys kind of went and, and did. <laughs> your due diligence in the homeless side of things and got these guys some form of housing and, and kind of got them off. Would that be the data that we can use now to say how we're doing in Douglas County when it comes to homelessness? And absolutely, any effort like that because um, all with all those 34 people, we were utilizing partner agencies to give them the services they need. We, right. had, a, we had a case of two individuals that were actually uh, in intensive care for at least two weeks of peace after we got them out of the woods. Um, so all of that data will go into the uh, coordinated entry system and we'll have that. Yeah, yeah. 
And, 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 and we know a, a big part of this also deals with uh, probably medication and others that are homeless that probably need medication and other things. <coughs> how, how is this program, and yet along with what you're doing, going to kind of tie it all together to kind of help both, you know, from medication to, and, and homeless kind of go hand in glove? How, how this program is going to do that? And somebody, I don't know who will chime in and tell me that part of it. Well, and we look at homelessness holistically, certainly. Yes. Uh, uh, we know that it's really hard to attend your doctor's appointments. It's really hard to keep track of your medication if you don't have a roof over your head. Mm -hmm. So we make a priority to get people housed quickly, mm -hmm. and we don't just abandon them. The idea is that we provide those services. Mm -hmm. And that's where the partnership comes um, with all of the agencies um, and municipalities in this area to help surround be the community for those individuals we okay. certainly want them to be um yes so this seventy thousand dollars that you're talking mm -hmm. about it, it's not administrative but it's strictly kind of dealing directly and touching what i call the boots on the ground with homelessness and possibly mental health and so on so it is for the management of the coordinated entry system. So it will look like um, case management. So it's someone to talk with somebody about what's happening, assess them, connect them to resources. So part of the 70 years administration? Yes. Okay. Got it. it is. Yeah. It's, so it's being used for staffing. So it kind of depends on how you want to define administration. It's okay. being used for staffing, but okay. in assessing the needs of our areas where we're implementing this, uh, that's a big issue, having staffing to do the data entry oh, and to help you. run the system. So it's administrative in the sense that it is for staffing, um, but it is for staffing that will directly touch people who are accessing the system and connect them to resources. So with staffing, though, how much of that, whether it's 70 plus or 70 less, what's the percentage that will deal with staffing, which you got to have the people administrate it, you know, the kind of the administrators, I'll call them. Um, how what's the percentage of uh, I'm hoping that the state will give you more but but I'm just kind of curious to know kind of how much is where and what what's that percentage uh, so in most of the areas we're working with they're using the entire amount um, so uh, is the 70,000 the entire, amount, the entire amount administrative or the entire amount directly to the, to the home the, en the entire amount being used for positions that manage the system administrative okay Got it. And, and speak of Douglas County, though. I mean, not in general, speak of Douglas County, if you would. Please. But yes, right. I believe all of it will be used for yeah. staffing. For staffing, okay. Yes. Got it. Got it. Um, but let me also say that the part of this effort is the conversation around funding. Mm -hmm. um, so we have multiple funding streams for this through our community. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is um, building up agencies. Um, talking about funding holistically okay you're doing this let's do this mm -hmm. and so um, it's it's an important part of the process and and I think that um, there are services that exist mm -hmm. and making sure that those get to the right people and that we're all working together mm -hmm. really makes those resources go much further right and, and, and I get it you got to have the administrative side of that I'm not don't think I'm picking and trying to pull that out to say, you know, too much sure. is going to the administration, but you gotta have that part of it because we gotta talk to those that need it and we gotta find where they are. And I know Charlie knows exactly where they are and probably even more that's needed. Uh, you, you spoke about a one-on-one -on -one match, uh, Charlie, about, I'm assuming through United Way. Mm -hmm. is, is this, will United Way and others kind of tap in the other resources that they may have to do to help out with this to kind of go directly to that because I mean we go way back Charlie and all of us go way back and trying to do this as vice chair spoke of when we were early you know 13 and 14 trying to figure out how can we deal with homelessness and we and I'm glad that we are that we're really trying to dive in and, and dig even deeper so I'm glad to hear this type of a program but with the one-on-one -on -one match that you spoke about well um, one of the, the main things when we started working with United Way mm -hmm. <clears throat> was about leveraging money yes and um, for instance with the kids home initiative we had a one-to-one -one match agreement so if you gave money to us the coalition for the kids home initiative we sent a check to United Way and it automatically doubled. Understood. Then United Way looked to the Seamer Foundation, which okay. supports this effort, and they doubled it again. Mm -hmm. So uh, for this period we've been supporting that, $1,000 becomes $4,000 mm -hmm. when somebody helps. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, currently uh, there's other uh, 
10 opportunities we're looking at with the United Way with continuum of care, mm -hmm. uh, they're very, very much involved mm -hmm. in, in wanting this coordinated entry to work. They're, they're, <coughs> they're a big player in that. So if you have any comments about funding on that. I think, like I said, we have multiple funding competitions throughout the year, mm -hmm. and so uh, building capacity for agencies uh, to be able to take those, because obviously federal funding becomes comes with some match requirements. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so the more we talk about that in community, and the more we resource how to make the people who are doing it well do it better, and then then the better, the more funds hopefully we can bring to Douglas County. Great, great. Um, okay. Commissioner Mitchell, I will yeah. mention that I work with United Way and, and uh, uh, with a limit. Uh, they're very interested in helping with the sanctuary village concept as far as the not the the people that are going to be helped that are not out of the court system, the people that are out of the um, homeless camps and so forth. And uh, they are uh, looking very strongly at the first of the year, uh, giving us a three to one match Good. on funds we might raise. So they they've been good job. Perfect, perfect. Okay. And, and and I'm gonna wrap this up though. Um, uh, Jennifer, we, I was talking earlier and you talked about the $10,000 years ago that I thought that there was an ongoing uh, piece of monies that we kind of gave to this organization. So Jennifer, if you'll help me out with that part of the of what that number is and what that ongoing number or, if, or did it stop at some point or did I miss it? It was a one-time. One Contribution. Yeah. Well, let me let Jennifer. Oh, if it if it were, if you're referring to what um, we have right. in the system as a vendor as Douglas County Shelter Inc. No. Okay. That would be um, maybe Fast Support's initiative. It would have been under the Douglas County Continuum of Care Coalition. Inc. So even the Fast Support piece though then connects the dots with this program as well. So I mean, I just know there were some monies that always have been set aside. Mm -hmm. That we it's been nine thousand dollars uh, started in 16, 17, and eighteen. That okay. was Julia Hills. Women's. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I don't know the details other than it's just done <laughs> right. shelter. Right. I, I just knew there was some as, as as Vice Chair Robinson spoke about. I knew there were some dollars and cents that were out there that that I always looked at when going through the budget cycle that this number was ongoing. <laughs> to, I don't know whether it's passed forward or to United <coughs> Way or Juma, but whomever it was, it was an ongoing piece of money that was going out, you know, to help with this homeless crisis that we, we were trying to account with. So, um, uh, last but not least, uh, I know we all know, because we, I mean, I, in my district and others, we, we deal with the homeless, and, and it's not just in District 1, it's just in Douglas County. How do we, I'm assuming this program will definitely have those operators or administrators or whomever else that would actually, you know, you gotta gotta be boots on the ground because you can sit back at the desk and talk about this and put it on the internet, um, write it up in the paper, <laughs> but it does no good unless you actually go to where they are. Uh, it's easy to say this, uh, that yes, we're gonna administrate this um, from our office versus administrate this, that administrator going uh, behind closed going down at the transportation center and, and actually going where these guys are set up in tents and, and kind of what we do. Is that the plan or is it that we're gonna get the word out again via the internet, via the signal, or kind of what is that plan? How are we plan to run? All of those things. So there's a subcommittee that is focused on outreach. Mm -hmm. And so certainly um, there is funded outreach here, like uh, Charlie was talking about through uh, um, Hope Atlanta, and I know you guys as a coalition do a lot of outreach efforts, so that is a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, the money, um, the city is matching some of those monies with uh, a vehicle, so this person is going to be able to travel. The city, you mean? Are you seeing like the city of Douglasville? Yes, like the city of Douglasville. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so they're providing that okay. um, for those that person to be able to do that, and so it's it's all of that co coordinated efforts. Okay. Um, so yes, there will be a outreach that will be in the newspaper and flyers, that sort of thing. But that's pretty. That part is pretty. Absolutely. Yeah. But the important part is the outreach efforts that connecting those people yes. to the system, and the outreach efforts in Douglas that are already happening are amazing. Mm -hmm. And so that was 
also an easy and pretty part because it's just connecting those dots. Yeah. And anytime um, one of our agencies, our member agencies, connect with somebody once this is up and running, mm -hmm. we're going to determine that they they are in either in the coordinated entry system or get the information. We already have plans mm -hmm. in the county and with the uh, sanctuary village right. to enter every one of these individuals into the coordinated entry system to yeah. have a have the right kind of you know, survey so we can get all the information they need for initial entry. Yeah, because I mean, we're already, uh, I mean, just the Thanksgiving and, and Christmas holidays coming up, we're, we're already, you know, got plans and, and, and to actually feed the, the homeless and, you know, kind of give them uh, some key essentials, you know, that are needed. So that's just an ongoing thing that we've been doing for forever to include Charlie Yugi with your efforts as well. So don't, don't get it twisted. But uh, with this $70,000, is there any matching from the county that we're looking at that 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 the kind of our efforts because I, I know we've got nine thousand dollars going somewhere but in, in the other <coughs> effort, that's from our end so the way it works on um, the, the group we've been meeting like i said since november and doing some research on some different models um what the group kind of decided was the city of douglasville is the lead agency for this because they had the office space and the vehicles to match the seventy thousand dollars because it didn't require mm -hmm. at least an income match okay. of the seventy thousand dollars so they will be the lead agency with all of the other partners um assisting with the process the county um what i agreed to do is take the lead in the point in time count where myself and the united way and a lot of volunteers will go out on january the 21st and we will do a count of all of the homeless people in the county, and then uh, we'll be able to have that data to provide to the group. Uh, but that's that's the match is going to come with the city of Douglasville because they had the, the space and everything to match the grant. We as the county, we don't we won't be providing any funds. And there now there will not just be housed at the city because we certainly are count, uh, covering the entire county. county yes. So we're looking at mul uh, what they call centralized multi-site. So they will travel to multiple places throughout the week mm -hmm. um, and obviously connect with those who aren't coming in and going out as well. So. Okay. And, and you spoke about the point of contact. Point in time count. Point in time. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's a day that every, I guess every county has to do a count. Um, and this year it'll be, is it whatever? January 28th. January 28th, and it's every two years? Yes. Every two years. HUD mandates every two years. Yes. So we will, um, um, with the help of the United Way, go out on that evening and hopefully with the help of all of our partners and do the count. And um, what I will do is at that time, we'll, I will come back and um, update the Board of Commissioners with the information that I've found. And, and Charlie, I'm assuming you're going to be closely tied into this because you know about where 80 to 90 percent of these individuals are well absolutely yeah because <coughs> to have a you know somebody just kind of trying to drive around and find them it, it's not as, as simple as it may sound but you know and you're counting uh sheltered and unsheltered <laughs> yes. for that night now normally the the douglas count has been a, an estimate based on other mm -hmm. continuum of care counts so mm -hmm. uh having really a good solid physical count right. is going to right. be a, a big loss I just didn't want to miss anybody just from the fact of we just trying to just ride around the county and find them. Uh, again, I don't know where, you know, 50% of them are, but I know what quite a few of them are. Well, uh, another big player is uh, the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd. Yes. yes. Daily Bread Ministry. Yes. They're, they're going to be closely involved. Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, and it's a great way to start out the system because mm -hmm. we're hoping to have the efforts planned and implemented by the point in time count. So as we're going out to count folks and survey them, we can say, all right, let's talk about getting a house instead of just saying, all right, here's the McDonald's gift card, see you later. Right. Not that that was happening before, no. but um, certainly this is a, a great a great way to start it off. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, that's all I got. I'll go back. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all uh, for moving homelessness uh, forward in Douglas County. Thank you. Okay, next we, um, tomorrow, commissioners, please take a look at the minutes and we will discuss those tomorrow and approve accordingly. Proclamations, we have two tomorrow, so we have one by Patricia Watley uh, proclaiming International Care and Kindness Week, so that'll be tomorrow, so we will look forward to that and proclaiming number six, the week of Farm City Week in Douglas County by Mr. Joy Rainwater tomorrow. And public hearing, we have three public hearings that will be held tomorrow as well, so we will look forward to hearing from our Director uh, of uh, Transportation, Miguel Valentin, so we'll look at those tomorrow as well. And number 10, we have a resolution uh, to approve and adopt 2018 Companies of Land Use Plan, and um, 
manager Ron Roberts will be prepared to do that tomorrow. Were you planning to present something today? No, no ma'am. Okay, so that'll be tomorrow as well. So we're moving right along. Uh, County Administrator, do you have any business? No, no ma'am. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, first business item is tab number 11, authorization to accept the Victims of Crime at Boca continuation grant in the amount of uh, $351,937 from the Prosecuting Attorney's uh, Council PAC and the Georgia Crime Justice Coordinating Council, CJCC, and authorize the chairman to sign all necessary documents and amend the budget agreement. <coughs> Laura Thompson, hello, Laura. Good morning. How are y'all? Good morning. Um, yes, this is our continuation grant, just um, allowing us to accept the funds um, for another year. Okay. Any uh, questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much. Thank you. That was good. That's pretty self-explanatory. Thank you. Tab number 12, authorization to submit through EarthCon an application for a joint brownfield grant with the City of Bella Rica and Southern Conservation Trust and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Manager Ron Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, staff began looking into the brownfield grant opportunities this past spring with EarthCon, and I have Jessica Turner here from EarthCon. We recognize this as an opportunity for business development and investment. Uh, a single applicant re can, could receive up to 300000 for phase one and phase two environmental testing, but with a coalition of three entities or more, we had the opportunity to go after $600,000 worth of, of uh, phase one and phase two testing. Um, so the coalition uh, that we put together is with the City of Villarica, the county, and the Southern Conservation Trust, which is a nonprofit. Um, that is a uh, um, we had one meeting with the, the county manager and the city manager in Villarica and Southern Conservation Trust was here. Um, basically, what we're doing at this time is we, if we decided that as a group we would, did want to pursue this. I received an email this morning from the um, city of Villarica that they had uh, uh, passed a resolution that they were wanting to be a part of this with us. Um, just to, to break it down, this, this is a, an opportunity not just for the city to identify parcels um, and the county to identify parcels, but also citizens. And as such, we also have a public meeting on this um, for the 13th, next next uh, Tuesday nights from 6 to 7.30. And uh, we're trying to get the word out to get citizens there. The uh, EarthCon has been helping us um, with uh, putting together the format that EPA likes to see. It's a 10-page submission and it's very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. And so they've asked for a moderate uh, $3,000 to help us put this together to move forward with it and all the coalition partners tentatively agreed to do that and uh, at the, the last meeting. And uh, I was gonna invite Jessica, did you wanna add anything to the <coughs> Hi, good morning, I'm Jessica Turner. Um, I've been working with Ron for a few years now and this is really an op opportunity to do is to find those um, vacant, unused parcels in your community that can be redeveloped the, uh, for um, uh, positive reuse. Um, some examples are, you know, uh, vacant gas stations that have been abandoned. A lot of times they get turned into coffee shops or, or other types of uh, whatever um, business needs the community has. So the, um, the public engagement meeting is one that is required by EPA as part of this grant application process. Um, but it's an opportunity to get the community citizens involved, get their feedback, understand what they're looking for as well. And we tie all of that in together with the redevelopment visions of uh, Douglas County, the city of Villarica, and the Southern Conservation Trust, um, which is redeveloping that vacant um, golf course. Right. Yeah, and to, um, some new park and green space as well. So we're taking the three coalition partners and packaging that up um, to apply for this grant. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Guyton. Uh, yes, I represent the Villarica part of Douglas County. So uh, mm -hmm. where is there a vacant golf course? This, oh, uh, well, the Bear Creek. Bear Creek. Oh, that's, that's not in my district. So. Mm -hmm. that, that's within Douglas County. Okay. So this grant application will cover anything within Douglas County, um, within the city of Villarica, mm -hmm. and that the Southern Conservation Trust is um, the third coalition partner, and they're focused specifically on the Bear Creek. Right. Okay. Um, I thought there was a federal site out there that uh, 
uh, had a listing of all brownfields. Those are existing brownfield sites. Those are generally um, either already um, federal or state. There, there's a separate state brownfield program. Um, those are traditionally more suited for private developers that come in with their own funding source. That say I want to take this old abandoned warehouse and turn it into loft apartments or something like that. And they come in and they fund it on their own. Um, they apply to the state brownfield program to get the liability protections. Um, so they don't carry those over. They're bringing to clean it up to the reuse standards that the state requires. And they also get some um, redevelopment tax credits for their <coughs> property tax bill. Mm -hmm. So the state program is also great, but that's a separate program than what we're looking at for the federal <coughs> EPA grant. You mentioned um, abandoned um, gas stations. You know, the law was passed where they have to remove the, uh, the tanks <coughs> once it shut down for so long right. so that alleviated a lot of the problems so that some of them had the old tanks that were not double walled yeah. there and are some making, i know there's one on 78 because I, I i tried to set it on the courthouse steps <coughs> about the the soil under it mm -hmm. <laughs> that was contaminated all right there yeah. are some tanks still on the ground at a van. I don't know specifically for those sites in um, Douglas County. That's part of doing these phase one and phase two site assessments. Mm -hmm. The phase one goes in and looks at the entire history of a property um, since it was first developed. And that can be developed back in the 1800s as agricultural land. So you look at the whole history of that property, what it's been used for, if there was any um, potentials for release of contaminated materials to the ground or soil. Um, so you look at all that. And if you find a potential for release, whether that be a tank or some chemical storage for a mill site or something like that, then that uh, goes into the phase two environmental assessment where we actually go in and collect soil and groundwater samples and um, assess uh, the potential contamination. So this is to identify new sites. Yes. Because right. we've got, we know where Arabic is and Basket Creek and mm -hmm. places like that are. Yes. So, all right. Thank you. Oh, you're Thank welcome. You. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Ron, I mean, you and I had this conversation a couple of times about uh, some brownfield properties and things of that caliber. So, yes. um, it's good to know now that the Lord is on board and, and kind of moving in that direction, which I think is, which I think is great. Did the city of Douglas feel not get engaged or did we we, we approached the city? I, I had uh, conversations and meetings with, with, with staff commissioner. Right. Um, right. And obviously, when I first started digging into this uh, and saw the opportunity, I was like, oh, first thing I thought of was the old mill site and the, and the jail. I was like, right. Man, they really could use it. Their timetable was really fast on that. So they had kind of like already done the phase one testing. Got it. Okay. But, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, we still were working with them uh, to identify some parcels that they want to put on our list when we submit the grant. So, so those two properties you just mentioned, which I, I thought that they would definitely be jump right on. You're saying that they could be coming on board, or no, they've already went in a different direction and, and got that those types of federal and state dollars. Right. They're they're them. more uh, they're going towards the mitigation now. They've done the phase one, phase two <coughs> testing. Okay. And I think they've identified something. So there there are other grants that that deal with cleanup. This yes. is dealing. This deals with just identifying and finding where the problems may be. Understood. 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 And then, but so the city's actually looking at doing the cleanup. Okay. Because okay. I know we had these conversations before, yes. you know, many moons ago about about kind of going in this direction. But I was just a little baffled that I didn't see the city of Douglasville, you know, kind of embrace them in this particular makeup. But if they're moving in that direction, which is fine. I mean, but you you mentioned the two that I was definitely kind of a little shocked. Oh, and and part of the reason we've had to, uh, I, I, I targeted that discussion with you yes. was because I was looking at seventy eight. Yes. Corridor, yes. and I, and that was in your district, and I, I knew that you would have been engaged and wanted mm -hmm. to do something, and so that's kind of like we're, if somebody wants to do something with a piece of property that that they think might have some contaminant, then all they have to do is sign that they'll let people on the test, and then we can include those <coughs> parcels. Understood. And um, so we're excited about that. Okay, understood. Okay, all right, I yield. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Roberts, thank you also as well. I'm, I would just like to add that the Senate newspaper did a very good job um, explaining about the Brown Bill grant uh, and introducing it to the citizens of Douglas County. So thank you so much. I saw it in the paper last week. Uh, 
Tab number 13, authorization to accept the 2019 heat grant in the amount of $31,110.93 from the Governor's Office of Highway Safety, GOS, GOHS, and amend the budget and authorize the Chairman to sign all related documents. Um, Good morning, Holmes. Commissioners. Major Holmes, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is just a, a renewal of the grant. We've been getting this grant probably back 2004, 2006. It's our, one of our traffic units, and uh, we very much appreciate it. Okay, any questions for the board? All right, thank you so much. We move to tab number 14, authorization to accept the 2019 Western Regional Traffic Enforcement Network grant in the amount of $19,850 from the Governor's Office of Highway Safety, GOHS, and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Major Holmes again. This is where we are the uh, coordinator, grant agency and coordinator for this. We are involved with eight counties in the western uh, metro area mm -hmm. uh, and uh, over 30 agencies that uh, participate in this and we're actually the coordinator for this and that's for these funds are used for training um, within the uh, network agencies okay any questions from the board it's also it's pretty self-explanatory thank you so much Major Holmes. The next one is authorization to submit an application of approved roadways to the Department of Public Safety for the insurance of an updated <coughs> speed detection device permit and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Major Holmes again. Yeah, this is it's time for us to do the renewal with, with the state for the uh, detection <coughs> devices permit. So okay, I believe that links to what we're doing tomorrow. I guess on some public hearings also. So. Okay, any other <coughs> questions from the board commissioners regarding this? Very good. Okay, next we'll go to tab number 16, authorization to apply for and accept the Emergency Management Performance Grant from the Georgia Emergency Management Agency. Uh, Director Milholland, good morning. Good morning, how are you doing? Oh, uh, this, um, this is the grant that we um, ask for every year where we meet certain standards within the Emergency Management Program that this, um, the, state, uh, the state and feds give us some funding. It's a match grant, but they're, they're allowing me to use, we always use my salary as the matching funds for it. So there's no additional impact on the budget. So we're asking to, and I've, I've met all the requirements. So I want to go ahead and see if we do a thing, apply for it and accept them. When, if they, um, the only caveat would be if they came back and said there's not federal funds this year, then they wouldn't get your money. It's all contingent upon the, um, but we've met all the requirements for this year. Um, this year, so we should be getting the money. And it went back up, they cut it last year. By ten thousand dollars, and it's back up to its original thirty-nine thousand seven hundred twenty-one um, this year. So, just asking permission to uh, finish up the paperwork and apply and accept it when it comes in. Okay, sounds the funder, for the federal funding. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the board of commissioners? Yeah. Uh, commissioner. Yeah. Related. Now, one more time. What's the actual purpose again? Is to um, help fund emergency management agencies. <laughs> Most emergency management agencies are underfunded throughout the state. Right. This supplements if you're if a county is doing what it needs to do for emergency <coughs> management, having a director, meeting um, certain planning requirements. Yep. They have that additional um, funding for equipment and additional plan, you know, plans that are not already included in your budget. Right. You just can't supply it. You know, can't say, well, if we just start using this money for, you know, to take money out of the budget, that's the only thing they don't want to see. But this, that's what this grant is for, is to help fund emergency management agencies and buy equipment and uh, help with planning purposes for emergency management. It, it, and that, that's, I mean, you hit on the head about, uh, we just had a, a transportation committee meeting and it, it's related about this need to be to plan and not be reactive. I mean, yes. the very thing that the federal government says, like, okay, we can do better at the local level. Um, you know, back to long-term capital plan, which we'll be talking about here soon, um, at some point uh, before the end of the year. But I, I, I want you to drive home that point about planning and that there, there should be certain dollars set aside for us to, to coordinate, to be more efficient, you know, to have more efficient use of funds when they do come. And um, so I, I just wanted to highlight that, that I heard it right. I need it back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the board? From the board. I'll go to tab number 17, authorization to enter into an agreement with the bold planning to add emergency operations plan and hazard mitigation plan modules to uh, current web-based hosting of these plans and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, this uh, currently we use bold planning for our copy of operation plan. Uh, over the last few years, we went through with every uh, a lot of the agencies in Douglas County to help them have a contingency plan if they were to lose their office or lose, um, um, but not be able to operate where they are. So we we built that. We really like the module that they use. So we'd like to add our emergency operations plan. Currently, our emergency operations plan 
is a paper copy only. And if you can't find your copy of your emergency operations plan, your paper copy, you you know, you don't have access to it. It's not something that you use all the time. I'm trying to get that web, to get on this web-based um, program where, as long as you have an internet connection, you'll have a paper copy. And if you've got an internet connection, you can pull it up and sit on it and go through the processes that they need to follow as a, as a county during their emergency situations. I uh, wanted to also do our next um, hazard mitigation plan on there, but um, the way the, 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 these plans, everything has to be bid out. These, these plans are not, the, are, not, are not cheap and they didn't need to be properly bid. The emergency operations plan is properly bid through the GSA, but the other one, the, the way it was um, the already bid, I don't feel, uh, and Director Peacock doesn't feel it really meets our standards, so we need to go back and look at that. So pull out that hazard mitigation part of it and, and make sure it's properly vetted and properly um, um, bid out. So this, um, so I just asked him to change this for only the emergency operations plan that we feel comfortable with. And then we'll come back and revisit the next hazard mitigation plan. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, I'll move on to the next one. It's tab number 18, authorization to approve an agreement, uh, um, agreement with Lexus Nexus and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents to the legal department. Yes, ma'am. This is just um, the same agreement we sign with Lexus Nexus every year um, for their um, web based research that we have to use. So this time we're going to do it a three year agreement. They're going to hold the price for us, the same that we've been paying every year. And there's language in there that if we need to get out based on funding not being there, um, we're protected with no penalties. Okay. Any questions, uh, Commissioner Robinson? Yeah. Speaking of research, this, this, does this give you um, access to historical, or what? I mean, what, what does this mean for us? It, access every, to research. Basically, everything that's ever been Attorney General opinions, mm -hmm. case law, anything that's out there and all courts, all districts, yep. all states. Yeah. Okay. The reason I bring it up, Madam Chair, is not to belabor, we can uh, take it offline, but it, it's, it's the need to get um, data and historical. Um, some of the things we, we rely on um, the Department of Labor regarding unemployment, or we would have to rely on a realtor's group to buy this home, price appreciation. There's other data points that we should have access to historically and, and actually commit to it at a very reasonable amount, Madam Chair. Um, it's just something I just wanted to highlight. But we do it legal. But what about the other areas that are here? Are you? Just something for us. Thank you. Uh, did you have anything? No, ma'am. Tab, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. <coughs> thank you. Tab number 19, <coughs> authorization to approve an amendment to the contract with Terminus Municipal Advisors regarding the Cub Cobb Douglas um, Community Services Board financial review analysis and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to legal review. Director Holman. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask that um, I believe Commissioner Robinson wants to briefly discuss this with the board members today, but um, I'm still uh, working with David on him sending the amendment to the contract. So this would actually be moved to the next meeting. But Commissioner Robinson wanted to kind of go a little bit into this project um, today just to kind of brief the board. Madam Chair, if you yeah. permit, you permit. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this is something that we talked about a little bit earlier about the relationship between um, Cobb, Douglas, CSB. And it's something that has evolved over time, um, changes in leadership, et cetera. And it, it was always the question that we had amongst our board is that are we getting our fair share of state dollars uh, regarding that, that relationship? Um, you've got Cobb and you've got Douglas. And um, I believe it's something like an 85, 15 split, et cetera. But we always questioned it. We do recognize that we are contributing to the CSB, but we recognize even when we were trying to expand our mental health, there was frustration on the judicial side, which is, well, it's not responding the way we need to. We're going to cut our own side deals. Right? So now we're trying to get more efficient about, well, let's get a real claim on the dollars that we are due, and then can we do this a better way? So. Um, we were advised, um, I, I had to, um, <coughs> Madam Chair invited me to a meeting with um, some of the board members on CSB, and um, we realized we need to put um, a, a higher financial tuning um, fork on um, the financials to see, okay, what, are we really being dealt our hand, or are we really getting <coughs> our fair share? And it was something that we decided to bring Terminus on board. We thought about doing an audit, but it was like, okay, that may be overkill. We can bring our financial advisor to come to the table and sort of dissect this in a way to answer seven questions, and we'll talk about that next time. 
but really how much money um, should we be getting and how much are we not getting and is there any other um, opportunities that we can sort of maximize our, our value. Um, I wouldn't just leave it like that. I just wanted to bring it to the Board of Commissioners because, again, we're always looking at the spin and we're always looking at grants and we're always looking at but when do we ever go back in and check what we're supposed to be getting, right? And uh, we're providing services to our local community. The state, in essence, has been awarding some money, but we do question whether or not we're getting our fair share. The only way you're going to be able to do that is to dive into that and, and challenge the numbers. And, and, and not let it be a political moment, but be more of a, no, the numbers are the numbers. So, I you. That was all about Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reporter. Thank you, Jennifer. Further discussion in our next meeting. Yes. Okay. Tab number 20, authorization to amend the workers' compensation fund in the amount of $440,000 due to higher claims than anticipated for um, fiscal year 18 to be funded by the workers' compensation fund balance. Funds, fund balance. Uh, Director Holman again. Yes, um, and looking at all of our funds during the year, uh, we noticed that the workers' compensation fund, um, the funds are exceeding um, prior years, even probably going three, four, five years back. Um, when I reached out to Matt Laverna, our risk and safety director, which he, he, he had to step out. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, just to see what was going on, um, he had some information that he was going to share. Just from what I remember, his discussions with me about where, when he did a comparison um, from last year to this year. Last year there was around three surgeries in the workers' comp. This year there's 13. Um, so. We hope it's just a blip, you know, just like health care and our health care claims. One year we can have high claims and next year, you know, it can go back and normalize. Um, but fortunately, the workers' comp fund does have fund balance um, in it. Um, it has a fund balance of about a little over $600,000. So we're asking to use 448000 of that to cover this year's claims. This is just a budget housekeeping. Um, request the claims are still being paid or it's not that we're not paying the claims or anything this is just to get the budget back in line to what actual expenditures are Thank you. Um, any questions from board Commissioner Gardner uh, Jennifer didn't we not just recently make an adjustment <coughs> to the workman's comp or is that for next year adjustment we took some money out of it we did we had this is uh, we had uh, we took um, six hundred thousand, I believe, seven hundred thousand yep. out of it to go into the health care fund to help its deficit. Um, and but we still have after taking that out, we still had six hundred seventeen thousand dollars remaining. <coughs> so we need to use four hundred forty-eight thousand of that to cover this year's claims. Okay, so we're not going to be short. No, ma'am. In there. Okay. No, I get back. Thank you so much. And also, um, Solomon, as you were looking at, the, at this concern, and I did, I sit on the safety committee, and I did um, uh, certainly um, bring it to, I brought to um, Director Laverne's attention that surgery definitely has an impact. Uh, that's my field of surgery, and I know the cost is very high in those areas, so it's not a surprise. And I told him that. I said, based on three surgeries versus, versus 13, so it's definitely a variance there. So thank you. We're going to move on to the next item. Uh, is authorization to amend the 2018 budget for revenues to be received. Uh, Director Holman. Uh, yes, in reconciling our Department 190 general appropriations budget um, for this year, uh, Michelle and I went through there and found that um, there's some funds that's either going to be received from um, grants or that is money that has already been received and money has been set aside from, or set aside it's been assigned or reserved from fund balance. And um, so what we're doing is just make the budget whole again in 190. Um, you can see like just the list of $22,250 was expended from bond funds that we had already set aside for Whitestone. Mm -hmm. uh, 50,000 um, we, uh, we got reimbursed from the West Georgia Regional Library for half of the cost of the Lucas Springs uh, Library replacement. Um, 89000 is what we are expecting, according to uh, Director Watson, uh, regarding the FTA on the cost of fueling station at the rideshare. We're going to be um, reimbursed about a third of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
$82,535 from the tree fund for the annex. There was some landscaping and trees that was done over there. And then uh, $30,000 uh, for some probate revenue for some vital record fees. So um, the items have already been expensed in 190. We're just wanting to offset that with the ones that have revenue coming in or that have a fund balance set aside. We wanted that to match up. So this is just primarily a housekeeping item. Okay. Any questions from the <laughs> Commissioner Guy? My ears perked up when you said why mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that has been in a assigned fund balance. Yes, so you're not moving it out of there, are you? Well, we're only moving, we assign it when we receive the bond money. Uh -huh. Then as we spend it, we move it out of assigned and let that money be there to be spent. So that's what the $22,250 is. As the money is spent for Whitestone, then the bond money is released okay. and it's just unencumbered. I thought you were using my money that we've set aside for that project. So, uh, so they've done some work. Um, I believe it was some it was engineering. On the it was on the design. On the design? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> so it is being spent on Whitestone. Yes. yes. It is money. All right. Yes. <laughs> I get back. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Robinson? Yeah, but, but to, I mean, to get Madam Dodge's point, I mean, you, you, <coughs> grants, bonds, all those things, those are revenue sources, right? Mm -hmm. That we account for. I mean, it's not just normal taxation, fines, and fees. Mm -hmm. There's this other bucket that you from an accounting you just have to is how you keep up with it is that mm -hmm. what i'm just hearing and i exactly. get the housekeeping but it's just for the record yes that is just we just want to match if there is an expenditure in department 190 or any department but in this case it's department 190 general appropriations when we did the analysis and saw that any expenditure in department 190 if it had a funding source then we want to match that funding source to that expenditure so it's budget neutral right Revenue expenses. Got mm -hmm. it. I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to tab number 22 authorization to approve a task order agreement with Atlantic Coast Consulting for an RFP, uh, which is request for proposal services for procurement for privatization of the solid waste services at the Douglas County landfill for a cost not to exceed $15,000 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Jenkins. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. That's right. It's uh, been a long time coming because our solid waste business was just about within eight years of filling the landfill up. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be some decisions made as to what we're going to do. Uh, it seems to be that the trend in the round Atlanta is that the municipalities, local governments, are closing their landfills mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're transferring it out. Uh, what that means is that's what we do now with our household waste. We collect it, we put it on trucks, we send it to Polk County via a contractor. And uh, so that's a very efficient way to do it. We got one, two large companies right here locally who <coughs> may have an interest in partnering with us to do something fact is we don't know what that something is yet. So uh, I just throw some with public services, waste pro, if they have <coughs> waste management, waste industries, which is just for our bank here. So we're gonna put it out, see what sticks. If anything, we may not get any responses, or we may get some partial responses or consideration to lease the whole landfill. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be landfill material. It could be compost material that we do not have now that we don't use. It could be uh, solar panels mm -hmm. on top of the landfill. Perfect shot to the east to pick up that morning sun. We don't know. And uh, we're not going to know until we get them all in here. And this is the <coughs> first step in figuring out what do we want to do. Is this a better <coughs> the cost of closing that landfill is going to be about two, two and a half million dollars. Then, it's a construction project, it's really all it is. Then it's going to be 30 years we have to maintain it. And all this is regulated by EPD, some by EPA. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a new, I don't know what you call this, it's a, I guess it's a law. Next year, we've got to come up and have a five year review of our design and operational plan. It has never occurred before in Georgia. 
Okay. And what that means is it costs money. And it's all unfunded. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not going to get any better. And the sooner we figure out where we're going and what we're going to do with it, <coughs> the better off we're going to be. <coughs> so this is a 50, this is an initial uh, run at doing anything. Mm -hmm. Now this $15,000 is very inexpensive. But it's going to get way more expensive as we go along. Okay. And this is primarily for the initial assessment, correct? This That's is, it's okay. initial yeah, uh, mark share that advertisement. Right. Okay. Uh, any questions from the Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Robinson? Thank you, Madam Chair. So, again, back to, I'm going to keep harping, <coughs> long-term capital planning. Right, we talked about this during our retreat. <coughs> County Minister, did we talk about this officially? During the this retreat? item? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, we did. <coughs> we did talk about it, so I want to make sure we, we carry a consistent theme on, as a Board of Commissioners, especially <coughs> as a district, we, we, you know, we appreciate the administration, how you guys are bringing forth things that, like you say, these are $2 million pops. All right, so it's our job to go in there and check and balance like, okay, now that in addition to everything else that we got on the list, how do we plan this? And it can't just be reactive or planning in the moment of a political moment. It really, some of these things are just, you got to do. So let's put it on the list and see what it means for us. And so um, I support this, uh, but not in the absence of a long-term capital plan. It says, oh, no, that's got to go on the list. I need to see that $2 million hit. When do you anticipate it's going to hit? And we need to get some real thoughts to it so we can you know, align properly with prioritization. But um, you know, we have these moments where staff will come in, they'll pitch this, and somebody else will come in and pitch that, they pitch this, and it's like, okay, guys, it, everybody's got to ask. And um, for us to make real decisions on the behalf of, of the citizenry um, and make it effective and really line this up, we need to we, we need to see this holistically. So I, I um, county administrator, I'm going to come back as we get into this budget process, <coughs> that long-term capital planning. This is something I, I, I'm expecting will be on the list. All right, I'm, you guys get my point. Um, you know, as we go forward, we're going to make it more formal. Uh, <coughs> on this right here, um, so your ask today, though, is you've got the money for this, right? Yes, sir. And this is just authorization to award this to these um, the same firm. This firm um, helped us last year, right? That's correct. As far as framing this. So this is somebody that we're familiar with, right? That's correct. Um, there's a history here, right? Okay. I just want to make sure that, um, and so it wasn't necessary to go to uh, um, a, a RFQ or RFP. We believe that we could just, because these are professional services, we could select them. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Okay. I yield. <coughs> okay. All right. Well, yeah. I, I, I got one, one little quick, quick question. So, so this fifteen thousand is this coming out of the enterprise fund? Yes. Okay, so it's all enterprise. Yes. And even in the future, what we may or may not have in dealing with this whole closure, whatever direction we decide to go, based on the information that we receive on this, um, would that also be looked at from the enterprise fund or from the general fund? It's enterprise. enterprise. Okay, that's one thing. I just, I just want to hear it. Are they done? Are they done? No. So I, I fear it is to get to the end of okay. not being enough money in the enterprise. Right. right. Got you. Got you. Understood. 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 But but that's where we'll start. That's correct. Right. Not saying we'll end because that, that that's probably somewhere we'd like Vice Chair stated. This is, this is a, a, a long range capital plan that we got to look at and take a hard, serious look at us in which direction we end up going. But. Uh, I just want to make sure that I know kind of where we're going. Capital, I mean not capital, but enterprise fund or general fund. But I see now it will tap into the, the general fund. It just depends upon kind of what direction we take sure. and <coughs> how much it costs in the end. Okay, <coughs> that's great. I you? Okay. okay. Commissioner Moe here. Yes, yeah, it, it was glossed over pretty pretty quickly. I have, I have no criticism, I, I understand. <coughs> uh, but the, the fact that we have the potential for uh, solar power generation there at, at the landfill. That's okay, fairly, fairly common practice. It takes some technical expertise, technical expertise. Pairing that with the cost of shutting down uh, a landfill, we have to very, consider, very seriously consider that potential for a solar farm because it can have the potential for of offsetting our cost entirely or mostly uh, by having, having a solar farm there and to touch on something very briefly you know we now occupying the uh, 
uh, government annex, and it has all the old uh, RV hookups and so forth. And uh, I have asked staff to look at the potential for uh, uh, having uh, electric cars uh, for a very defined purpose, if it's for our assessor's department or our uh, uh, tax <coughs> department, uh, to be able to charge up at those sites with, the, with solar panels and kind of set through the face of, of uh, progressiveness in terms of energy consumption to ener energy uh, mm -hmm. uh, generation and uh, start on a, on a small scale with uh, some electric cars for that uh, annex building. I know it's a small it's a small thing and, and electric cars, in my opinion, have they, they have a long way to go, you know, really prove themselves uh, uh, economic, but <coughs> used in the context of, you know, building inspections and, and the tax assessor's department, I think it would be a really good fit. And we were, we've already got the electric line run. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know staff is uh, following up on that. I'd like to hear on that. I yield back. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mokri. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, so glad to hear about the solar farm as well because Cox Enterprise has already introduced it to Douglas County. So I'm with Commissioner Mulcair uh, here on that. So that's a still a sign of progression as we move forward. Uh, tab number 23. Authorization to accept the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant in the amount of $16,424 and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Stanley. I'm going to yield to Major Holmes on this. Okay. Um, we appreciate this. Uh, these funds also, uh, they will be used to uh, uh, purchase equipment to enhance and assist in the detection and investigation of narcotics investigations. <coughs> so we greatly appreciate this. Okay. Any questions from the board? Um, thank you so much, uh, Major Holmes. <coughs> Tap on 24, authorization to amend the GE with the GEP of <coughs> uh, uh, 457B deferred compensation plan agreement for Douglas County employees to permit plan participants to make Roth contributions to the 457B plan and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Perry? Yes, Madam Chair, this is just giving us some flexibility for our employees to make. Uh, Roth contributions to uh, to the 457B plan. Mm -hmm. uh, traditional IRAs, you typically realize tax savings right at the time of contributions, but when you pull the money out, you're taxed at that time. Roth IRAs work uh, just the opposite. You're taxed right at the time <coughs> of contributions, and uh, you know when you retire, you know it's tax uh, tax. The money just go untaxed at that time. So it just all depends upon what. Uh, what fits into your budget, what your uh, retirement strategy is. Mm -hmm. Pay now or pay later, pretty much. So, uh, but you're going to pay. But you don't pay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's just giving us some flexibility in that regard. So we want to make that uh, available to our employees. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's the flexibility for our employees. Commissioner Geider, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, the cap for 457. <coughs> Is it 19,000 now? It has been increased. Comp. And I, I can get that amount to you. I believe it was 16.5. But I, I could be wrong. It seems like they just recently that. raised it up. But you're saying that instead of just putting it into a 457, you can put it in a Roth? That's correct. And it's deduct the tax is deducted now yes, rather than later when you withdraw it? That's correct. <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I know what it is. <laughs> but it's uh, a lot of times you, when, when you retire, you're in a lower income tax bracket. That's why people prefer it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the. So uh, how do you get so, word out to the people here in the county uh, that work for the county as to so they, they can understand it. Well, uh, I've been working with uh, with Paul Bates on that, and we're going to be working with Paul uh, pretty much on an <coughs> annual basis to have him to come in and make presentation on a number of things regarding our retirement plan. Uh, uh, we'll be holding those in uh, in Citizens Hall, inviting employees to come out and talk with uh, with, with Paul about the retirement plans, about <coughs> a number of things, this being one of them. Uh, so we'll make that available at that time and typically what I do is I'll send out an email and try to make it as uh, uh, simple. as simple <laughs> as possible. So they can understand. Now used to we had uh, a representation from 
each department, and they would go back and they would explain a lot of things. They would, I think you used to represent the sheriff department on things like that. But um, we could do it that way. I'd rather the employees. Do we have? Go. Do we still have that set up? I guess. Oh, you got a pension board. Well, <coughs> does it, is each department represented on the pension board? Not each and every department. No. No. No, each, each department is not represented on the pension board, but uh, when we open those uh, those meetings up in the Citizens Hall, anybody can come. I'd rather the employees come and, and hear the information for themselves. That way it's, you know, it, it's no confusion when the, uh, when the information is relayed. So uh, I either come from myself or come from Paul Bates so it'll be clear. But as far as the Roth I, uh, IRA contributions, it's, it all depends on the individual. And it's nineteen thousand for next year. Nineteen thousand. Yeah, about about eighteen five this year. Yeah. Eighteen five. Thank I you. Get that. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, okay. Director Perry. Uh, tab number twenty five: authorization to create and fill a position of transit <coughs> service coordinator by combining transit services coordinator and compliance officer positions. Director Watson. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> As we increase our mobility services and we increase our dependency on federal grants to help us operate these mobility services, uh, it's been our desire to hire two individuals to help us with this. Uh, one is a transit services coordinator who will basically oversee the, the bus service for us. And the second position is a compliance officer to help us uh, muddle through the <coughs> thousands of federal regulations that we deal with on, on a daily basis. The transit service coordinator position is in the 2018 budget. Uh, the compliance officer uh, has been included as a BIR in the 2019 budget. Now, as we have been interviewing candidates for the transit services coordinator position, we quickly realized that we had undervalued that position. The salary that we were offering for that position was $55,000 and the, the really good qualified candidates that we've talked to about it, they're, they're talking in the, the seventy dollars to $75,000 range. The same would be true for the compliance officer. So what we're looking at is if, if we increase the salaries that much, <coughs> That would be like an extra expense of $40,000 for the county. So, so we looked at combining these two, two positions uh, to save some money for the county. However, now, this morning in the Transportation Committee meeting, this was a topic of discussion, and it was a consensus, and a consensus of the committee that these two positions by themselves are, alone are very important and that, that we don't need to combine the two, that we need to leave them separate. So the recommendation coming out of the Transportation Committee this morning was to increase the salary offered for the Transit Services Committee, uh, Transit Services Coordinator, uh, from $55,000 a year to $75,000 a year. So that's, that would be our request for the board this morning is to increase the pay for that particular position by that amount. So that item will, will be revised. Um, that's what Gary's saying. Instead of instead of what it states, it'd be authorization <coughs> to revise the transit services coordinator position from the salary from fifty five thousand to seventy five thousand. Okay. And that's how it will be done. Okay. Any questions on the board? Yeah, let me again. This this is important um, to lay for the record. You know, whenever you have a special call meeting, it, it's like, okay, what was the, the what was the purpose? Um, and when this was placed on the agenda, and, and it was important, I said, well, no, leave it as is, uh, because uh, it, there was some disagreement uh, within ourselves um, as to why are we combining these two functions, which we knew that uh, from our experience in keeping up with all the capital transportation fund grants and stuff and the money was you know missing and so forth we knew we needed we have grown to a point where we need somebody dedicated so leave that alone we also knew bringing on this new uh, uh, bus system that you're going to need a dedicated resource totally dedicated to that not everything else we want to leave them alone but when this was put on the agenda it, it seemed like it was a fast <coughs> track to me like why are we doing it this way if you just want an amendment, say that. 
Um, because you, you, when you have special call meetings, you know, people sort of look like, okay, so what are they up to? That's important. <coughs> special call meetings should, should not be for expedience sake just to make an agenda. It, it makes the public sort of pause and sort of like, so it's important to me one more time, transportation to say, no, we didn't just call this to be calling, we accommodated it. And we went ahead and took it on just to address it, but let's be careful how we use special call meetings. You have to plan around, we only come to, we only assemble every two weeks. We only assemble, right? I mean, just like the General Assembly is about to be called back, they're so like, oh my God, the General Assembly is about to be called back, they've never done that since I've been here in 10 years. And it, you should only use that, you know, you know, again, I get it, but let's not make something that was just for convenience sake, like it wasn't that important that it couldn't wait. I know that we're behind, but again, let's be careful with that. And I just wanted to bring that out, Madam Chair, as to why did we do this? How are you? Okay, thank you so much. <coughs> All right, thank you so much, uh, Director Watson. I'm gonna move on to tab number 26 and 27. Okay. Can I oh, just I'm sorry. Ask a general <coughs> question <coughs> to Gary. Uh, uh, Director Watson, please. Sure. Do you have the breeze kiosks set up now? No, ma'am. They they haven't installed it yet. Do you know when they're going to do that? We have a herd problem, <clears throat> which is ironic because they they were in a I rush to, to get us to push you through, and now they're they're the right. ones holding it up. Okay. If you'll just let me know. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Are you in that part? Thank you, Commissioner Pat. I didn't see your hand. My head was down. I'm sorry, it was a last minute. Okay. Uh, last but not least, we have tab number 26 and 27. This is uh, Director Peacock. Uh, authorization to award a contract to Pond and Company Corporation for professional consulting services for the transportation scoping study <coughs> for the Lee Road Extension Project for the total cost of $313,890 to be funded by the CTF and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review, Director Peacock. Yes, ma'am. Back in uh, early October, uh, you, the board authorized us to go negotiate uh, with um, the lead consultant that we wanted to bring onto this project. So we, d we did that. Uh, we negotiated uh, the terms and conditions, uh, adjusted the scope of work a little bit, and negotiated the price. And so this is the price that we're bringing back to, to the board today asking that you allow us to go ahead and authorize the contract, award the contract to Pond and Company. Okay. Any questions from <coughs> Commissioner Geiger? Uh, yes, and, and I know I've said this before. Why are we going to stage three when we hadn't even started in stage, stage one and two? Could not this money be used to widen uh, Lee Road and, and that would be economic development. If you widen that road, uh, it'd probably bring in some industries and everything. It just seems like we're, we're going so far out into the future with our splash, splash dollars. Uh, I think people expect <coughs> us to do something with it that's more readily seen during the period of the six years. So uh, I don't understand why we are going so far out into the future. Um, I'd like to proffer the opinion. Okay. Commissioner Moore here. Yeah, um, I, I, did you yield? I want to make sure you yield that. Well, I... Well, she was asking with, a question. With, um, <laughs> yeah, you can just... I will yield to him. Yeah. Okay. 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 Go on. That's all I was like. I, I, feel, I, feel, I, feel, the question. I feel so pr privileged. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm just proffering my opinion. Uh, this uh, is not being funded by uh, SPLOS. It will be funded out of the... Uh, uh, Transportation fund, capital transportation fund, and that's a whole other issue. Talk about future planning. Is that 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 CTF is? Uh, we're getting close to the bottom on that, and uh, we'll have some serious discussions about replenishing that money out into the, out into the future, uh, which which must be done. Uh, but at the same time, specifically a scoping study. Uh, in term, this this would be three hundred thirteen thousand dollars. Let's just say three hundred fourteen thousand dollars would just absolutely be a drop in the bucket as far as paving. Uh, winding uh, Lee Road. We've got to find uh, a permanent, real, and, and substantial uh, funding stream uh, for that, and likely largely through uh, federal state grants. Uh, I think, I recall, it was uh, 21, $21 million dollars uh, to finish out the Lee Road. So as I said, this this almost $314,000 would, uh, would barely scratch the surface of that. So that, that's really not... Uh, plausible. Um, the 
purpose of, of studies and all these things over time just they just they cost more and more you know I hope to see this uh, Lee Road extension started when I'm still alive here in, uh, in Douglas County and so you have to plan for that you have to have a, uh, a serious engineering to project study uh, to know really what your eventual costs are, are going to be so I don't think it's out of line uh, and I'm sensitive to what uh, uh, Commissioner Guider has said, you know, I looked at the uh, uh, initial uh, Lee Road extension, <coughs> uh, I hesitate to call it a study, but the proposal, <coughs> and uh, I looked at the cover of it, it was, it was dated 2009. That's, uh, that's nine, nine years ago we've been talking about this thing, to your, to your point. Uh, I don't think the, the I don't think the will, and certainly we're in a, a hiatus in terms of in terms of funding uh, because of the housing recession and other things going on. It has, it has delayed that that project, but this is one of the most uh, impactful things that Douglas County can do. It has huge uh, economic development implications and transportation implications for Douglas County. And I don't think it's out of line that we we need to do this uh, scope study uh, for this three road ex extensions. So I go back to <laughs> Madam Guy. And I apologize. I looked down and I saw the next uh, item where it said the splash. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Fund. That's fine. And so, uh, but the capital transportation fund is our rainy day fund that we put aside in case something happens that we have to throw some local funds in to immediately maybe to get a grant you know, the matching part of a grant or, or whatever. And like you said, it's about pleaded now. So um, I just like to, I, of course we have to look to the future, but when we have so much on the uh, table at one time, why can't we address the ones that's on the table? Why, why shouldn't they be the priority? I understand the importance of the ARC. I understand that. And I'm not against that. I'm just saying the funds that we have here could better be used for immediate um, purposes. That um, in some point in time, the state's going to say, hey, we will do this intersection if you will match the uh, grant. We, we will do this intersection on Highway 5 or 92 or whatever, and we're not going to have the matching grant. How about funds to do it because we are depleting our capital transportation fund. Capital transportation fund was your idea many years ago. Put it back for rainy days uh, and during 2009 when we had the flood and we had funds going out the windows and the doors of the county mm -hmm. and we have to spend it before we can be yeah. reimbursed. Yeah. And so if we don't have that, <coughs> those funds to me, that is very important to have. <coughs> it's kind of like a savings account, you know, each family should have three or four months uh, savings account in case they lose a job. And this is a, the same basic idea is what I'm saying. Uh, I hate to spend this much money on a project that may get done 15, 20 years out. So I, I just wanted to express my opinion. It's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. I just disagree with what we're doing here. And I do ask that it be put um, in new business. So uh, I yield back. Okay. Thank you so much, for Commissioner. I saw you here. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Yeah. Sure. I, no, I appreciate that one. We'll labor the points, and you know, we, we, we get the recession. We get um, coming in off of all of us, except for Mo here. This was the hand that was dealt. Lee Road is what it was. We went through a recession. Um, we um, again, we could. Uh, focus on um, the fumbles as far as keeping up with money and when it was spent and so forth. And I won't believe that. We, we get it. I mean, it's no more than 92 right now. Some <coughs> things may take 20 years. They may 20. They, again, some things that we do in government <coughs> will, will extend beyond the elected term of individuals. Some of you guys are uh, bureaucrats. You, you've seen it come and go. You've seen probably, you know, maybe three chairs, right? Okay. We get it. All right, and our job, it, again, is just to move it along, we're elected, we move it along, and we make the decisions based on that moment, right? Um, I, I think this is, we, we gotta play long. You don't have the money to finish Lee Road today. We had this conversation last year almost this time. 
uh, when we realize, oh no, we don't have the money. So let's not act new, like, oh my God, there's another priority. That was the priority. We realized, oh, we can't fulfill it. And, and then Miguel comes in and says, oh, the numbers have changed. So let's not be loose about what we're looking at. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and um, do what we can. Same thing, and you hit the whole point. When we were going through the Great Recession, when that general fund was what? We were down 24 points we had to get out of that thing. And what we said was, well, let's go ahead and plan and study in the meantime. And so when the money comes, we can take action. Let's begin to set aside money in these you know, capital strategic opportunity funds. And we did it. Right? And it's coming back slowly. But you know, it, 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 and they run in parallel. So I, I appreciate what staff is bringing this forward. I think you can still, still do the short game, get, get what you can right now until things come around when you get, because these are big buckets. That's my one more time. Y'all got to put this on the list. Y'all got some big capital projects that are coming down, man. You got um, staffing for three verticals going up. It's like one more time. And I don't disagree. It's like, yeah, we, we're in a different place now. Now we're going to emerge out of this recession, and now you're going to have money, and everybody's grabbing. One more time, Steph. No, we have to set a priority. Like, no, we can't do all that. Right? We, we got to lay this out. There's a lot that's coming. A lot's given to us for the revenue streams that will be coming here soon. But at the same point, we've got to do better planning that. I don't disagree. And I, I'm hoping that through this budget process, we can get a real refined capital um, plan before this guy gets out of here to really set the future. This is okay, guys. But one more time, I don't want to belabor and be critical of the times past. We get it. I, I understand. Let's move forward. I yield out Chair. Okay, Commissioner Gardner. Just, just one more thing. The flood happened in 2009. We had a bridge in Whitestone washed out in 2009 that has not been rebuilt. Those people's property values just plummeted. Their subdivision is cut in half. Uh, I've been told that uh, even though we got some money from the state, we got the developer, the new developer, to put some money in there. We're calling in the bonds. We got we got some bond money and all this stuff. But now the price, because we've waited so long, the price has gone up, and we're going to have to find the additional funding for that bridge. Capital Transportation Fund is probably where it would have come out. And if it's depleted and we can't build that bridge, I'm going to the news media. <laughs> because we have promised those people, you talk to anybody that lives in Whitestone, the fire department has to go a mile around and come in the back way if the, the fire's on one side of the gulch, the, the washout or on the other side, but their property values, they 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 bought $300,000 homes that's valued at half that now because who wants to buy a house in a subdivision that's not built out and is divided by all the amenities? The amenities on one side, they're on the other side. This is not fair to our citizens, and that's why I, I'm trying to hold on to some of this capital transportation fund because it is promised. It is promised. Uh, we approved Whitestone in January of 2017, mm -hmm. and we haven't moved any dirt yet. We've had a study, but we have not moved any dirt yet. It's going to be a prefab bridge. I found a vendor down in Savannah when I visited down there that they do prefab bridge. And we were going to do all the work. We were going to set it down <coughs> in place, and it was going to cost a certain amount of money. Now it's, that price is just way under what they are proposing. Mm -hmm. I want that bridge built. And the people of that, that subdivision, that area, they deserve to have it. We have state funding that we're going to have to send back if we don't do something with it. We've got WSA funding that they threw in 50000 mm -hmm. uh, 75000 from the new developer, even though it wasn't his road, but he wanted to build. He, he's going to build out that subdivision with very nice homes, but he's not going to do it while there's a big gulf that's divided. So I'm just saying we do need to set priorities. And they're not just in one district. They're all over this county. This has been going on since 2009. Mm -hmm. And I yield back. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. 
I want to just go, go clarify something. Uh, this uh, item 26 is what we're doing, we're, uh, we're authorizing the award of the contract. We had already approved uh, funds uh, for considerably more. There was 560 something, 500, we, we'd already approved funding uh, 560,000 and some on. So this is actually coming under the, uh, the pre-approved amount. Uh, let me touch on, on the CTF. Uh, that's where I'm placing my, my stake in the ground. I posted my flag as I go as I go into the, uh, the last budget, uh, the uh, last budget retreat. It was okay. three three fifteen. The five sixty seven was a mistake. That was that was Lee Road South Sweetwater. South Sweetwater. Okay. It's three fifteen. Okay. It's three fifteen. So this is all this is already funded. And we're just uh, here uh, uh, awarding mm -hmm. the contract. Uh, getting back to my flag in, in the ground. The, the CTF uh, was intended to address hot button issues and, and to uh, fund my recollection and my thought was opportunities to expand and improve our, our road system. If it had been, been a study or, or a, a matching grant or whatever, I, you know, I always felt like that was appropriate. So if there's a, an issue or confusion or discussion around that, I think it would be good to establish a policy exactly what, what the CTF is for. I think our discussion this morning uh, brings that to the fore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it would be very appropriate to just establish what, uh, maybe get some recommendation from our DOT director. What should the uh, CTF be used for and what should it not be used for? It was a godsend, as uh, Commissioner Geider alluded to, during the, uh, the flooding of 2009, being having money set aside mm -hmm. and getting things done. I can remember, I mean, the, the waters were still rising and we had consultants out on the road and out on the bridges, you know, looking at things and, and getting things prepared and done because we had that CTF. So one of the things I want to leave office with is, is see the direction of that CTF being revitalized and considerably uh, uh, funded. Uh, Okay. By, by uh, January 1st, 2018. Okay. So I yield back. 20, thank you. 2019. 2019. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, I'm sure. We're almost done. Okay. Yeah, all right. I mean, no, but <laughs> today, just as for Jennifer, can you send out back to the Board of Commissioners? You've done this plenty of times. I'm sure you just need to refresh it. Uh, money in on the capital transportation fund from day one and money yes. out. Sure. Um, and I, I don't disagree with Commissioner Walker. You know, uh, again, it was truly a bipartisan um, approach to this. This was something that we had universal, like we need to do this. I remember we used to sit in those budget meetings and stuff and horse trade on that last day. Half million, four million, one million. Uh, I remember we quite, I mean, it was how you did it um, and got that thing funded, right? It was dedicated. I think Commissioner Mitchell was focused on what he was worried about was the, the ta uh, TANs and so forth. And so um, we, we recognized um, how important this was. Um, I don't disagree that a policy needs to be established. Um, uh, one more time. I think we have a policy, but we need to, can we amend it? Codify it, yeah. Okay, we'll amend it further. So we'll, we'll take that up. We'll work both, with both committees um, um, and, and work through that. But I don't disagree. I think, um, and I think the comment about one district is really, it, it's unfair because it keeps being, well, <coughs> one district didn't even want to be built out. It didn't, it didn't even, it, it didn't even want to be, it's like, that's unfair. Uh, I, I think that some of the comments are, just advocate. Pay attention when it's moments put stuff down. Don't complain about anything else that comes forth in the sense that we're all sitting at this table and we're all conscious. We need to know how the rules move. Learn how to move the agenda. But don't be critical of the sense that like, it's like nobody's doing anything wrong. There's no single district that's dominating. Everybody's equal. Put your votes down. <coughs> work to get votes and move the thing along. I agree, <coughs> Chair. Okay, thank you so much. And also, County Administrator, if you could, and uh, along with uh, Director Valentine, if y'all could just kind of put a little fire on that Whitestone subdivision. It has been on the list for two years, and we need to move that. I, I was mm -hmm. under the impression we were moving. So. It's moving. We just, it's not finished yet, but it is moving. Okay, can we just snap? If you can elevate the movement. Yes, <laughs> okay. Yes, Thank you. Tab number 27. Shoot. Authorization <clears throat> to award a contract to KCI Technologies Incorporation for professional <clears throat> consulting 
for the transportation scoping study for the I-20 at Chapel Hill Road diverging diamond interchange for a total cost of $354,500 to be funded from the 2016 SPLOSH Economic Development Category and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Director Peacock. Mr. Till, how is this being changed? <clears throat> um, actually, it's being recommended from the Transportation Committee. Uh, I think we have 235000 <coughs> budgeted for in the CD, CTF, and then the 119000 the remaining 119500 would be, is recommended to be funded from the, <coughs> the fund balance. Okay. This is, the, again, this is uh, the, the second. Again, back in uh, early October, you allowed us to, uh, gave us the authority to go negotiate terms and conditions scope and, and fees uh, with KCI Technologies. Uh, the Department <coughs> of Transportation and I have done that. Uh, and what we're bringing back to you today is the, the final uh, fee that we've agreed to, to have uh, KCI do this study for us on the I-20 PDI. Any questions from the board commissioners or comments? Commissioner Ross? Yeah, this, this was an item that, that to the point there's a I need to bring this out. Um, the board of commissioners, um, excuse me, the, the transportation committee did meet and talk about this particular topic. Um, and we, we thought it was prudent to move forward. This is something that um, obviously had been on the, the books, what, four or five years ago, and it got stalled. So again, we're not belaboring history. You move forward. And so um, the committee recognized that move it forward but where the source of money should come from we thought that there should be a pause and it should come before the full board of commissioners uh we didn't think that uh, it, what happened is that it was put on the agenda coming out of the spa so it's like wait we, we didn't agree to that in committee so we just need to push back on that and um and, and make sure that because again back to priorities and it, I, I had no problem if in fact y'all wanted to fund that out of splost but Again, that means it's going to get on the list moved up in such a way that we didn't talk about. So I, I wanted to at least have that conversation. It's my position uh, amongst the full board. Uh, we do have money in the capital transportation fund for this. Is that correct? Uh, just to confirm one more time, it's money in there that was already allocated, right? We have a certain amount in there, but I'm, not the entire. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, $235,000 that's allocated for this project in the CTO. All right, so we're, we're saying that the committee recognizes that use that money um, as originally assigned, as stated. The reason what we're here to talk about is how do we uh, amend the difference on something that we think is very strategically important to the county. I yield with that, that was it. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to just say to the directors, thank you for working so hard to make sure that these meetings are conducted with you, the information that you bring forth to the Board of Commissioners. And then secondly, Board of Commissioners, do you have any other comments before I call for an executive session? Okay, at this time, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? <coughs> we do for a real estate and litigation, Madam Chairman. Okay, Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So we second. Yeah, we'll move, uh, second, a motion and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, please take another uh, yeah. 10 minute break, 10 minute break, and then come back. Right back. Thank you. All right, we're right. Board of Commissioners, um, do you have any other things to discuss today? Any other items we need to discuss? No, ma'am. With that being said, this meeting is adjourned.